Welcome to Engaging Culture, a podcast presented by Bridgeway Christian Church. I'm Brian Kiley. Today I'm joined by Josh Oot, Heather Johnson, and Damara Miller, and we will be talking about the Enneagram. The Enneagram is an ancient personality typology tool that's become very popular in Christian circles in recent years. We'll talk about our own experience with the Enneagram and how understanding your own Enneagram type and the types of those around you can benefit you in life and work and even help you in your relationship with God. All of that and more on this episode of Engaging Culture. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to Season 3, Episode 5 of the Engaging Culture Podcast. Brian Kiley with you. Pastor Lance is on vacation, but we have replaced him with three guests today on this episode, so it's frankly an upgrade if you ask me. I hope he's not listening, but uh, first, uh, joined by our most frequent guest on the Engaging Culture Podcast, that is the one and only Heather Johnson. Hi, Heather. Hello, Brian. Our (laughs) Missional Community Coordinator. Uh, Also joined by our Director of Connections and Communications, Josh Oot. Josh? Hi. How's it going? Oh, that's great. You good? I'm Fantastic. Fantastic. Happy to be here. Yeah. Good. All right. Uh, And uh, very excited to be joined by Damara Miller. Now, Damara was very involved here at Bridgeway in a wide range of ministries for a long time. Young adults, young professionals, etc. Has since moved to Portland and is now doing a lot of different things, including running some Enneagram workshops. Tell us a little Damara, why don't you tell us a little bit about that and what you're doing? Yeah. So I work together with another coach. So I'm a life coach. And my friend Jessica and I, we together created Enneagram Us, and we do trainings for churches on the Enneagram and for small group leaders and workshops um, that we created. So one right. on how the Enneagram can help us hear God Okay, is a really fun one that we've been doing. Awesome. Uh, we want to hear more about that as we get into it. But just to start, maybe Demary, you could, since you we we were joking in the office that this is sort of like the Enneagram podcast done by amateurs here, because we're all sort of like very, Peripheral. you yes. know, amateur Enneagram users. But, uh, you know, you're giving workshops on all of this stuff. So I think you have a little deeper understanding of it than we do. Uh, for somebody who's new to the Enneagram, how would you describe it to help them understand it? Yeah, so... In the most simple, simple way, which is hard for me to do, <laughs> is um, basically it's a way of understanding our personality and how God put us together, how he created us. And my favorite way is understanding it as we each reflect a different sliver of God's heart in greater measure than the other. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of these different nine reflections of God's heart um, and that that's in our natural design that he built unto us. And then when we're Living most freely as our true self, that peace really shines. And as we grow up as kids, that peace gets warped in kind of um, predictable ways. Mm. (laughs) So then the Enneagram helps us to be able to discern what's our authentic true self and what's our false self that we've adapted and how to move forward and get free. Mm. Okay. The true and false self. Mm -hmm. Say a little bit more about that. What does that mean? I know that's key to kind of understanding the Enneagram and sort of what type you are and all of that. Um, but what I mean that that language can be a little hard to I think yeah. to, to grasp. What, what is what does that mean to the extent that it can be defined? Yeah. So our true self, as in if it's a perfect world, God created us. He put us here. We're in the garden. This mm. is how I'm naturally going to show up. This yeah. is my passion, my desire. Um, even this is what I would fear happening mm-hmm. in a way as part of our true self. And our false self is because we live in a fallen world, this is how we adapt to that. This is how we change ourselves so Mm -hmm. that we can belong and feel safe. We started as kids. We keep going with it, keep trying to do it as we grow up, and then we get really stuck. And we think that we are being really ourselves without realizing that we're adapting and hiding certain parts of ourselves that we don't think are okay or not acceptable. And so we don't... um, A lot of the work that Enneagram really helps us do is get free of that false self so we can live more freely unrestricted. Got it. Mm. That makes sense. Got it. T- t- it does. Yeah. Well, and yeah. I think the the false self, I mean it 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 almost beca- it gets to the point where it feels like it's our true self, yeah. right? Cuz mm-hmm. we can become so immersed in it. And mm-hmm. and I think that's what I love about the Enneagram is that it's it's painful in some ways cuz it exposes some of that falseness, but mm. it's sort of like the the surgical wound that wounds you for <laughs> for the sake of greater healing mm-hmm. right yeah. I mean, Heather how have you I mean have you have you experienced that either personally or just with others that you've talked about the Enneagram with just that that process of kind of having it expose a little bit of your false self oh yeah well they say that's kind of how you figure out your type is what <laughs> what kind of 
is where you're kind of like, ouch, how did, how did they know that about me? Yeah. That's, then you, you kind of feel like, yeah, that's, that is, that's my true self. That's right. my, that's my number that I didn't know even some about myself until yeah. I read it. Um, I think that one of the things I like about the Enneagram and kind of how I explain it to people that don't really know much about it is that I feel like the power of the tool is it really reveals that inner motivation Mm -hmm. piece where I feel like some of the other personality um, frameworks reveal more of the behavior, the outward and the the power of the Enneagram is it names some of your inner motivations Mm -hmm. and helps me better understand myself and then helps me better understand others. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think that's what's, what is interesting about it uh, as well. And it, even it's funny talking to different people and hearing about their numbers. We were doing this even before we came on air with some of, some of our other staff is uh, people will say what number they are. And a lot of times people will say like, oh, I'm a, you know, such and such. Well, can't you tell? And always in the back of my <laughs> mind, I'm kind of like, well, sort of. <laughs> but that's right. the beauty of the Enneagram right. is because I can guess based on your behavior. Yeah. But a lot of these numbers present similarly, and what you're revealing in sort of diagnosing your own en- enneagram number is an internal kind of an internal uh, motivation, which is not always as easy to discern. Yeah. Right, that internal dialogue is just huge because yeah. that that determines our behaviors, um, or both in functional and dysfunctional ways. Yeah. Of how do we handle ourselves under stress? How do we handle ourselves when things are going great? Yeah. Why do I? F- why do I act one way when things are really well and then completely the opposite when things are going terribly? Like, how do yeah. you, how do you do that? And I think that internal dialogue piece, the Enneagram gives uh, verbiage to, yeah. Yeah. um, and it's, uh, Ian Cron and Susan Stabil say it all the time that it's not placing you in a box. It's just showing you the box you're already in <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. and yeah. other people know you're in that box probably better <laughs> than you do, um, for a lot of reasons, but it's, it gives you verbiage to now go forward. How do I go forward? That's why I I love that Enneagram um, piece of that is that it's always a mark back towards something. Um, It's not just a label. Right. Yeah. No, that's, that's really well said. Now, what I want to do just real quick is just run through uh, the nine types because there are nine types uh, on the Enneagram. And uh, Damara, you were just, we were talking beforehand how uh, defining these types as simply as I'm about to define them, that's only meant to be something that's kind of helpful for you as you're beginning to understand maybe what type am I, but it's not meant to be this like label that we right. carry with us. Cause mm-hmm. even within the types, there's a fair amount of diversity. I mean, is that, is that mm-hmm. right? Or is anything yeah. you would add to mm-hmm. that? Yeah. And that it's dynamic. And as we start to change, it's easy to hold somebody to that label or feel yeah. like you need to live up to that label to be right. your true self. And that's not it. We're actually flexible and dynamic and changing. Exactly. Right. Mm-hmm. So this is all I'm actually reading from Damara's website, Enneagramus.com. Uh, <laughs> just, these are the different categories and, and she took them right from kind of the most popular, at least mm-hmm. that I know of Enneagram book, the, Ro- the road back to you by Ian Cron and, and Susan Stabile. So, so the, the one is the reformer. Uh, two is the helper. Three is the achiever. Uh, four is the romantic, five is the investigator, six is the loyalist, uh, seven is the enthusiast, eight is the challenger, and then nine is the peacemaker. And even, and again, th- that is a, a one word description right. of, you know, you can read pages and pages and pages about your different, about the kind of the nuances of your Enneagram type. So uh, just to kind of get going here, Maybe we could each share, uh, Heather, we'll start with you. Uh, what is your Enneagram type? And then what was kind of your your journey to discover it? And maybe how has it been helpful to you in, in understanding yourself? Yeah, um, I'm a nine. <laughs> Just a little bit like AA. <laughs> Hi, I'm a nine. Hi, I'm a nine. Hi, I'm a nine. That's right. Um, and I... Uh, I actually really enjoyed my my journey in trying to figure out my number um, because I felt like it was an ideal situation. Um that I was able to determine my number with a group of friends who knew me well. Mm -hmm. So uh, I do an annual retreat with a group of college roommates and several of them were kind of going deeper into the Enneagram and they said, you know, we always kind of pick a topic for the year. So that this topic for this year was the Enneagram. So we each were supposed to read two books prior to coming into our weekend together and then discuss it and try to go through some different exercises to help each other determine their, their number. And I actually came into the weekend, um, pretty fried and had skimmed the books, but 
really kind of felt like I was a two. Like, I'm like, I'm mm-hmm. just, I'm just going to, I'm pretty sure I'm a two. And these ladies who knew me well, um, <laughs> were like, Oh, you're not a two. So, <laughs> so it was helpful because as we went around and, and really we spent the whole weekend, quite a few hours, um, going through the different numbers and trying to discern what was true about that description that they felt like, you know, that we both resonated with internally, but then what they had observed by, you know, with us through 20 plus years of friendship. Um, and so that was super helpful and hearing them, and there were two twos among this group of ladies. And so hearing them talk about what their experience was Mm -hmm. to be a two helped me realize I wasn't a two. Hmm. Um, and then as they, as I, you know, they kind of said, well, what was your other number? And, um, and so nine was one of them. And as I read through the nine, they were able to actually name things and label things Mm. that I didn't even, when they said it, it resonated with me, but I would not have been able to pick it on my own. Um, and so then the journey from there was to just sit with that for a little while and listen to interviews of other nines to see if there were things that resonated with me. Mm -hmm. And I remember listening to the typography right? Typography? Yeah. yeah. Typology. 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 Mm -hmm. That's it. I'm like, that didn't sound right. Um, (laughs) The typology website. And he was, there was this nine being interviewed and I, I, I was just blown away. I listened Mm. to it like three or four times just going, how does that man know my inner thoughts? (laughs) (laughs) Um, and, And so that really began me on a journey for me to more confidently say, yeah, I'm a nine and I'm going to dive into this, um, to, to, to just know more deeply who right. where my wounded places are so that I can grow in health. Now, yeah. you're a purist and yes. that you are not an assessment person. Like, I'm going to yes. take a test and have the test tell me. Yeah. Um, so can you talk a little bit about uh, why you think that's such an important distinction? Um, I think it's 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 such a complicated tool that it's really not a, it's not a BuzzFeed quiz. (laughs) You know, it's just, um, I think that the assessments can be helpful in getting us started, Mm. but, uh, but especially some of the numbers, there's an, there is an amount of complexity. I mean, there's complexity to all the numbers, but I think that especially for the nine, because we identify with so many different other temperaments, it's, you can get easily confused. So to just take an assessment, um, often isn't enough to determine what your inner motivations are because assessments aren't designed to quantify motivation. We're the only one who knows what our motivations are. And sometimes our motivations are even a little shameful to admit. So we might not even put that down in an assessment because there's shame attached to it. So to hear somebody talk about it, then you're like, Oh, Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, and that's, that has been, I think, one of the most interesting things. Uh, certainly, I've experienced it. And then in talking to just about everyone else I know who is engaged with the Enneagram is exactly that. You hear other people who are your same number talk about their reaction to situations, their life motivations, their just kind of emotional state. And it, it, it it's like oddly comforting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh, I'm not the only one. I'm not. At least if we're crazy, we're crazy together kind of thing. <laughs> and it's it can be. I think sort of validating, even while it's challenging, yeah. validating in a way to realize, oh, okay, like, yes, like you said, how does this person know my innermost, you know, workings and thinkings? And just, I, I think it's a way that sort of, I don't know, God can use this to help us realize, you know, we actually do think in some similar ways and we're not as alone in a lot of this as we, as we think necessarily. Right. Yeah. Now, Josh, we're going to go to you next only because... Well, I'll let you say what number you are, and then maybe you can share how your process was similar or different than than (laughs) Heather's. Yeah, so I am a nine, and I also have a strong wing eight, um, which I'll talk about later. But um, for now, uh, my process, my first introduction to Enneagram was awful um, because um, I got labeled by somebody else saying, oh, you are probably this. Um, And it was a three. And I just did not identify with that. And I kind of wrote off the whole thing like, eh, no, this isn't for me. Um, And also how people communicated about it was, yeah, the Enneagram tells you how you're terrible. <laughs> it's like awesome. <laughs> Sign me up. Yeah, I I pretty clear on that. I don't really need a test to tell me um, how I'm bad. Um, so for me, it it only happened after um, 
emotional trauma, essentially. Mm. Um, uh, I left our my last position at another church um, under kind of extreme circumstances. I had an emotional and mental breakdown um, due to a lot of behaviors I had um, due to how I was handling stress. Um, and I didn't have really a way to process that um, until I came here and uh, heard Heather and Sonny and Brian talking about Enneagram. I'm man, that's just lame. I don't really <laughs> do that. But the more that they talked about it and how it was useful for their own personal journey got me really interested in, in diving into it a little bit more. Um, and then reading through it when i read the type nine and what the type nine does under stress which is the mm. the downside of six um of that paranoia and the uh, suspicion and the kind of this almost self-inflicted wounds that a six will carry out i was like oh my gosh this is me and i start bawling mm. <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting in my living room with my wife sitting on the couch and i'm crying and i'm reading this to her and she's like this isn't this is news to you and, <laughs> and for me i'm just like weeping um as i'm reading my life story play out of the, mm. what the last two years were like for me of how i went from exhibiting healthy three habits to exhibiting the negatives of this six um, lifestyle. And so it's just all of a sudden that's when it really became clear and it gave me something to process. And then it began a healing journey within yeah. me um, yeah. that it wasn't because I'm a massive failure is what happened with within my failures. What happened within stress are things that I can work on, yeah. um, but yeah. there are also things that I can name now and that they're not just character flaws. Yeah. yeah. And that yeah. was huge for me. Yeah, no, that's uh, and that, yeah. One, once again, another hugely helpful element of the, the Enneagram journey. Um, yeah, that's great. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, Demara, how about you? Yeah, so I'm a type two. Okay. And I first heard about the Enneagram, uh, my therapist a few years ago mm -hmm. recommended it. She says she gives it to everybody for identity work. I mm -hmm. think she was maybe, <laughs> I think she was just thinking, you are a huge two and I need you to know this <laughs> that I can't tell you. So she gave me the book. Um, and... I'd set it aside in my piles of other books that I wanted to read that I didn't have time to because I was doing everything else mm -hmm. um, except very much self-care, not really mm -hmm. a lot of that. But then I was having a frustrating thing with God and I was praying and he told me to go get that book. And so I went and I dug it up and I read it and it just made so much sense. Mm. Um, and I remember as soon as I started the chapter, it was um, Marilyn Vansel's ooh, Self to Lose, mm -hmm. Self to Find. Um, as soon as I got to the type two, it just hit me and I had that, oh no, for about two <laughs> days I was spinning with like, oh, that's, that is me. Like I knew it, but I didn't want to, but I couldn't close my eyes once I saw it. And yeah. then it's been a process sort of repeating that <laughs> with a lot yeah. of new awareness and uh -huh. then moving through it and then accepting myself and loving myself in that has yeah. been huge. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the, the extent to which it, the Enneagram brings on almost a new level of self-awareness. Yeah. Right? yeah. And there's, there's, mm -hmm. there's some pain with that, but it's almost, it's like this process of some self-awareness is brought up that brings some pain that allows us to heal. And then as we go deeper into understanding the Enneagram and its implications, yeah. it's like that cycle continues. And it, mm -hmm. I don't know that we ever escape the pain totally, but the trajectory is towards health i mean i don't know is that yes. yeah that makes sense and more and more freedom, freedom all the time so then the more the momentum builds you're like well i'm so much more free so i can kind of take this new awareness yeah. it's gonna probably hit me hard but i know that it's gonna be more freedom so i'm yeah yeah ready to go that way yeah and no, when you can good. name your areas of weakness and risk and and heal and move forward without shame yeah. there's power mm -hmm. in, oh, yeah. in that that's that's supernatural power yeah. not on our own it's grace mm. it's it's freedom yeah. and i think that the spirit really uses this tool for that sort of self-examination self-awareness not as a shame piece to keep us you know locked and in bondage but as a freedom <laughs> piece to to move forward in health yeah no absolutely i mean it's it's, it's getting rid of that false self and, and yeah. putting on the true self right mm -hmm. so uh so i am a seven uh which is the the enthusiast and and my process was sort of interesting i, I listened to the road back to you i don't i, I honestly don't remember how i, I listened to like wh how i got turned on to it at first and after listening to it i really wasn't sure what type i was and it was actually when so my wife and i and then uh heather and and, and her husband went to a workshop together in the bay area and 
were sitting there after the first workshop and it was really funny was that Dave and I were both trying to figure out yeah. what number we were is we weren't really sure if we were sevens or threes. And, mm-hmm. and this really speaks to, uh, I think the power of the Enneagram in that it, 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 it kind of gets to the motivational component because sevens and threes present very similarly, very similarly on the outside, but it's a question of ultimate motivation. Mm. And I don't know what Dave would say. I mean, I know Dave ultimately landed on three. I don't know what he would say about kind of seven qualities. I would say I definitely have some three in me in, in terms of approval and everything else. But I, what kind of continued study and reflection helped me realize is at the end of the day, like I'm motivated by experience and fun and excitement and moments and all of that. Uh, so that's more of a seven characteristic where, where you're not seeking after primarily approval. You're seeking after excitement and, and, and all of that sort of right. thing. So, so that was sort of an interesting process. And then, and then with that, um, kind of similar to you, Heather, in that as I'm reading more, it wasn't so much the, oh my gosh, how do they know my inner thoughts? But it was like, it, I'm reading these characteristics of sevens, both positive and negative, And especially it was the negative ones that seemed to be like totally unrelated. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I have all of those. Those are all the, those are all the bad things I do, right? There. Um, so, but but I think it was helpful to be able to identify those things that I just sort of do subconsciously or with some sort of lame yeah. self justification mm-hmm. to be able to at least now have that little catch in my spirit. Like my wife will do that. Like she's like, "Are you saying this just because you're a seven? I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, you're right. I probably shouldn't say that. Uh, you know, and it's it it can be helpful to be aware of that. Um, so, uh, so one other element of this and and Josh, you alluded to it is the concept of a, of a wing. Damara, can you maybe explain to us how does that, how does that fit into this whole Enneagram puzzle? What, what is a wing? Yeah. So it's another aspect of it. And that's where this, I guess you don't really need it, the symbol necessarily, but if you've ever seen the symbol, it it looks kind of creepy, but (laughs) it's very creepy. Yeah. But it serves, um, as a good, it's a diagram to show us. So your wings are, um, the Types on either side of you, so the number on either side. So a three could have a four or a two wing. (laughs) And this is why I need the symbol. (laughs) Um, And so you could have both wings. You could have one more than the other. I personally believe that um, we have both, but one is probably just much more dominant than the other. But Mm, we kind of have easy access to that other wing that we can develop over time. and it's more, it it kind of flavors your type, mm-hmm. um, some in the motivations a bit, but a lot of, in the characteristics and the gifts and that is how I understand it. Yeah. 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 Um, and it's funny, I don't know about the rest of you, I mean, how, how your type... Uh, or sorry, how your wing influences kind of how you approach different things. But but I joke that so a seven is the enthusiast, but the six one ca- and I'm a six wing. One of the kind of elements of a six is they tend to be kind of fearful and nervous. So I say I'm ready to have a good time. Let's just all put on our seatbelts first. <laughs> <laughs> and I really like that captures me to it a sums it up. <laughs> I love, Like I'm this weird mix of like I love fun, but I don't like unnecessary risk or danger or anything else. Like I. Once again, going back to family, it's like, you know, I remind my wife of that when I'm like letting my kids rock climb. I'm like, okay, yes, there's inherent risk in this. But remember, I am constantly scanning my environment mm-hmm. to make sure it's as safe as possible. So right. anyway, uh, it's kind of funny. I don't know. Have any of you seen your wings kind of uh, affect you in different ways? Or was it easy to identify or difficult to identify? So my wing being a eight is, um, is different because the... So every number fits within a triad and blah, blah, blah. And we can get into that <laughs> if we really want to go down that deep rabbit hole. But uh, so uh, eight, nine, and one are in the anger triad, uh, which means that we access anger differently where then eight is very upfront. We'll access it outwardly and just let it, let it fly and then be done with it. Um, an eight or a nine will avoid it at all costs. Please, Lord, please don't let this. I'm not angry. Yeah. I'm not angry. And just deny, deny, deny. And then a one <laughs> is, is focuses that anger in. Inwardly. Um, so as a nine, when I read through all the, the anger part of avoidance, like I don't really avoid anger and then, but I'm not motivated by the same things that the eights are motivated by. And so I realized that I have a pretty strong eight wing that I really want to have the perfectionist side of one because that would be really useful. <laughs> that would be helpful um, sometimes. My wife would love me to have some of yeah. that as well. Um, but really I access anger fairly quickly quickly and um 
I'm not afraid of it um, as much as a, a typical nine might be. And so for me, that knowing that about myself was like, okay, it's okay that I can access anger. But one of the sh- struggles that I've always had is that whenever I've been disciplined in my life, it's been against the the eight stuff. Mm. Anytime mm. I access anger, don't you need to stop that? Mm. Huh. You're not allowed to be anger, angry. And so it's like, okay, so now it's trying to work through that. How yeah. do I access it in a healthy way? Yeah, that there's some really huge benefits of being very directive. It's like, yes. look, this is where we're going. This is the decision that we're going to make. Um, I'm sorry that you're not on board, but uh-huh. we can move forward with it. Whereas if it only comes out when I've reached my limit, then, you know, it's, it's terrible it's for not, everybody yeah. involved. So. Right. Yeah, no, that's, that, I mean, then that's good. And that, I mean, so, so much of this and that, and that speaks to a, another broader Enneagram concept, which is so much of, of, I think thriving and, and wholeness is, is kind of leaning into health in yeah. our different areas, right. but then recognizing, okay, what, it, what is unhealth? How can I begin to spot these things in me sort of before it really flares up and I'm, you know, burning the whole house down, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and it just, and it tells us where we're stressing, right? you know, and, um, cause like last week we had a meeting, you know, with the two of you and we're talking mm-hmm. through the path and, you know, missional communities thing. And idea was taken and I threw out an idea and both respond really positively. And I was like, I don't think they really like that idea. <laughs> <laughs> like they're just saying that right now. Cause they don't want to hurt my feelings, but I don't think they were like, and then I recognized that after I left, like, okay, that thought means I'm not operating from a place of health right now. Mm. Uh And so what do I need to do in order to recoup um, so that I can bring myself back into a a better balance? And so it's just a trigger to, as opposed to waiting for something catastrophic to happen, I was able to identify that inner dialogue earlier and then work towards, okay, I need some self-care. Great. I just need to go for a walk. That'll be nice. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, no, that's good. Now, um, that, that does sort of, it, it, in, a, in a sense, a little bit of a transition to the next thing I want to talk about. And that is just, I, I want to touch briefly on the limitations of the Enneagram or, or what are some ways that we can misuse it or, or misunderstand it? Because it's it's interesting to me, I mean, this sort of tends to happen in, in Christian circles and in, in secular circles as well, but it's like something becomes very popular and then... Uh, People get very excited about it, and then sort of the gatekeepers uh, say, "Hey, stop being so excited. This thing's actually bad, or or whatever the case may be." Right. <laughs> and we and 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 basically, there tends to be this overreaction of enthusiasm that is then countered by this overreaction of, of criticism. cynicism or criticism, and yeah. it it is the whole thing gets a little bit gets a little bit wonky. So. Uh, maybe different ones of us can just share some, some limitations. And I, I think one that I'll, I'll share is I think we just need to be careful that uh, we don't primarily find our identity in our Enneagram number. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That like ultimately our identity is in Christ and we don't need to let the, our Enneagram number be a source of pride or shame because right. it's just yeah. who you are. It's not, like you said, it's the box that you're already in. Uh, and that, you know, when we find our identity too much in our number, we start to be defined by what our number says we should be as opposed to who God yeah. has called us to be, which those things don't have to be different. Mm-hmm. We just have to take them in the right order. And, and I think some of the, the criticism of the Enneagram comes from, from those who see others finding their identity so much. In, it's like we're getting it tattooed on our mm. forehead. You know, it's mm. like, this is who I am. And, and I think that's a fair criticism to say this, this can't be the primary source of your self-understanding, that that's got to come from Jesus. Yeah. So, so that's one. What, what are some other maybe limitations that we need to keep in mind? Yeah, well, so just a couple of yeah. different ones on the top of my head too is um, it doesn't replace Holy Spirit. Like the freedom yeah. we get no, from the good. Enneagram, it's awareness, yeah. but it's right. him who actually gives us the awareness, that's lets good. it soak in, heals us. Yeah. He cuts stuff out and he transforms us. So I think it's really easy to slip into. And I know mm. I've done this a lot and have to kind of come back to, right, this is not, what is it, self improvement necessarily like it's good to recognize where i'm slipping into unhealth um and to have that check but it's really him any actual change is going to be really him especially because it's all internal motivation it's yeah like there's the fear and the desire and the insecurities like he has to take care of 
all of that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Josh, are there anything it, you would add? It's a tool. Yeah. I, I mean, I think I really like the phrase all of life as discipleship, mm-hmm. you know, that, mm-hmm. that God can use all of life, even the silly things, as well as the more complex things to, you know, transform us more and more into his image. And so I think it's a tool. It's mm-hmm. a tool to transform us into the image of Christ, um, more whole, you know, yeah. less old self, more right. new self, mm-hmm. you know? right. yeah. <laughs> more fruits of the spirit, less of the, you know, desires of the flesh. I mean, it, it, mm-hmm. it's, it, it, it's a tool. Yeah. Yeah. I, when it, where I see it going wrong is when people use that as an excuse mm. to not become more like Christ. Yeah. It's like, no, no, no. I'm a bad friend because I'm a five and that's, that's what I do is mm. I, I'm an introvert and, and I like to study stuff. So, um, I don't need to follow up with you. It's like, no, yeah. no, recognize that, you know, <laughs> this is your tendency and then make more effort to combat some of that. Um, you know, and then for me personally, the, the peacemaker part is that sometimes things need to live in conflict for a little while yeah and it's but my peacemaker doesn't need to be the excuse that i now take responsibility for something that's not mine in order to bring peace i need to recognize myself that i'm going to be uncomfortable and it's okay that i can be uncomfortable for a season um that nothing's going to burn down my house isn't going to (laughs) burn to the ground because i'm uncomfortable um you know so but it's not an excuse that we can use and it's not a weapon to throw at each other like well you're an eight so i'm not going to talk to you anymore it's like well Mm -hmm. okay (laughs) that's not helpful (laughs) that's not Mm -hmm. helpful yeah. 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 That's stereotyping. Yeah. Yeah, no, the stereotyping can certainly be unhealthy. And, and and you're absolutely right about the the excuse part of it. And, and I love what you said about, I, I think, being able to recognize, okay, like a, a nines in general do not like conflict. And I don't know that anybody loves conflict, but different <laughs> ones of us are more comfortable in it than others. They, 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 they they're just seeking it. it out, you know? Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Well, a little bit. Anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but to recognize, okay, not all conflict is bad. Mm-hmm. Right. And... And I need to be able to just sit in this for a second and not kind of go to whatever sort of medicating way I might find of just resolving this conflict immediately. Right. Um, now, might we want to work towards bringing peace? I mean, is the strength of a nine to be yeah. able to kind of keep a cool head and, and all of that? Of course it is. But when it's just this complete, like, we need to eliminate the conflict immediately, that's where it can become a challenge. And, and I've experienced similarly being a being a seven is sevens don't tend to like awkwardness uh like i can hardly watch the office like i just i can't, I can't do it and Love like ever it. since i was a kid like if i'm around what i feel is going to be an awkward conversation i'll still do this to this day i'll like subtly as an adult like plug my ears so i don't have to hear what's going on because i just i cannot handle it but to, to recognize that some of life is awkward some of yeah. life is emotionally messy and it's like sim- very similar to what you just shared josh is just recognizing okay my tendency in those situations is going to be to to flee or to fix it immediately. Mm. And that's not always the right no. approach. Yeah. So anyway, but yeah, awkwardness <laughs> is still terrible. So, so you should all ne- sit quietly. Yeah. In yeah. Awkwardness, <laughs> yeah. Right? We'll just, yeah, have our seven seconds of silence. Uh, here's my next question though, because this, this is where a lot of my advocacy for understanding the Enneagram comes from this question that I'm about to ask. And and that is, uh, how have you seen the Enneagram help you in the important relationships in your life? Mm. Um, Heather, can we start with you on that one? And then maybe we can just sort of go around and talk for a little bit. Yes. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. How have you seen the Enneagram? Uh, how have you seen, how has the Enneagram helped you in the important relationships in your life? Um, I think that, oh, so many ways. Uh, it's, I feel like it has increased, we've talked about this kind of around the office a little bit. I feel like it's increased my compassion um, because it's increased my perspective. Uh, I I can't, one of the, one of the authors talks about, you know, you, it's kind of the box analogy, Mm -hmm. right? That it gives, it helps you identify the glasses with which you already see the world and then helps you see that there are other ways to see the world. And so I feel like that seeing that there are nine different types and there's such beautiful uniqueness and strengths and weaknesses in all of them, I feel like has helped me just really increased my compassion and my grace, um, which helps my marriage, (laughs) helps my parenting, helps my coworker relationships, um, helps me be a better member in a, in a community of people because I realize it's not just me and my perspective. Um, 
it's given me a lot of compassion for my husband because I feel like I understand his inner motivations better. And some of the things that maybe before might have been annoying because it was just different than me. Now it's like, oh, that's why that that's why you do that. And and I would say the same is true for him with me, you know, like, oh, that's why you do that. So we have more grace and compassion for one another Mm. all on this path to healing. And that I feel like that extends into our office as well, because it's like, oh yeah, I can respect your differences and, and see the wonderful qualities that you bring without just being annoyed by the weaknesses that we see in one another. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, that, that increase in compassion is huge. It's a, it's a big deal. Uh, Damara, how about you? Yeah. So let's see, in my closest relationships, it's been really helpful so I didn't realize that I wasn't actually bringing all of myself to the relationships. I would bring mm. the helpful yeah. pieces that added to people's life, mm. not an inconvenience, mm. not a burden, not How very any kind of, of a strain. I know. <laughs> this is, has been amazing to learn. Yeah. And so it's kind of in learning about myself and realizing, okay, I fall way on this end of the spectrum, mm-hmm. um, of the far side of the spectrum of being as light weight in relationships as possible. Um, it's helped me to give myself permission to start to step out and say, mm. think of what do I need? Okay, it's different than what they need or what they want to do right now. Can I put myself out there, maybe be inconvenienced, even in my closest relationships, yeah. which is hard for me to even think that mm-hmm. there would be some kind of an insecurity in that. Yeah. Um, and so, but then being able to practice that and have them still uh, be really supportive and still love me, which, you know, head knowledge, sure they would, because if you think about it, you saying your preference for dinner, they're not going to <laughs> suddenly hate me, but mm-hmm. it, but feeling it and experiencing it, like all this head knowledge, but it comes with practicing it. And so, and even sometimes it would bring up conflict, yeah. which has traditionally been really hard for me. Mm-hmm. And so practicing that. And so it's really helped expose insecurities and then help me feel closer to them and them closer to yeah. me even because they can really see me. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's good. That's it, really good. Damara yeah, go and ahead. I had the opportunity to go through um, a, an Enneagram <coughs> discovery process with another group of ladies. And um, and I think that it, there's power in being known on that deeper level yeah. that mm-hmm. you that you're it, it increases intimacy because that you're you're showing not just the convenient or the, yeah. <laughs> you know, the yep. nice sides of you. And people can say, yeah. I, we love all of you. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that that's a, an added benefit as well, because you know that you're loved for who you are, mm-hmm. not for just who you're projecting yourself to be. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What, that's yeah. Great. Yeah. That's really well said. Josh, how about you? How have you seen it? Um, you know, compassion, obviously, I think that's huge. The grace for one another, the grace for myself, um, mm. which leads to better relationships with one another. Um, but I also see it in just the functional ways of like oh, an office um, yeah. dynamic that um, I'm able to understand some motivations from my coworkers or people who report to me um, in a way that I, I now have a, a way to engage with their motivations to help them see the value in whatever else is needing to be done or how to engage in conflict in a way that's helpful to them um, and not just helpful to me. Yeah. And I think the the hard part is that we always want to form people into our image um, <laughs> as much as we possibly can because we know how we think yeah. and everybody should also. Yeah. Um, but when we begin to understand that – the way that this person processes information is very different than how I process information, that their triggers are different. I can then meet them at where they're at as opposed to where I wish they were. Yeah. Um, yeah. But then also recognizing, hey, I've got to lean in and have a difficult conversation with you because it's going to lead to better things later. Um, but that's a real difficult place to kind of navigate. But I think what Enneagram has given to those relationships is an intentionality of conversation that yeah. I just didn't have really before. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, that's a really good phrase, intentionality of conversation, because because I would agree with that. Um, and so much of what I my answer to this question would repeat what, what you all have said. But I, but I think to, to recognize... To recognize more specifically the differences in in one another, I mean, and, and just you know, you said it, Josh. I mean that 
radically simple concept that like not everyone sees the world the same way that we all do. Yeah. It's just crazy to me. The more I think about that, the more like ingrained the idea that like, oh, well, I'm just looking at things objectively and everyone else must <laughs> see things the same way as I do. Like how deeply ingrained yeah. in me that right. is. It's very frustrating. <laughs> uh, but to, to recognize that and to be able to adjust conversations accordingly. Now, that doesn't mean you're being insincere. No. It means that you're being, I, I think, uh, Empath- trying to be empathetic Absolutely. to recognize, okay, uh, for the ones in my life, they're listening to their inner self critic all day. Yeah. So I need to be very careful if I'm going to bring criticism or correction, because I could end up being sort of the straw that breaks the camel's back, right? Yeah. Or the six, the person I know is a six, they're already fearful and are worried about the 87 things that could go wrong. So maybe with them, you know, let's let's talk more positively and like we don't need to rehash all of the potential mm-hmm. right. So yeah. So I think to, you know, to be able to calibrate your conversation based on that mm-hmm. uh, can be very helpful. And, and like you were saying, Heather, I mean, I think, you know, my own, my own marriage and my parenting and all of that, it's really yeah. helped to kind of to try to get inside the head of those that I'm yeah. closest with so that I can not, you know, sort of be really in a sense, kind of an accidental bully who's sort of mm. assuming everyone else is the same as me. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I think that's great. Well, my question for, for all of us is how do we engage in conflict um, at the level that somebody else has? Mm. So where, where their need is. So like, um, for example, my wife is a one. She has a pretty loud inner critic. Not, and I say pretty loud to just soften that. She has a very loud uh, inner critic. Yeah. And so my tendency is that I don't want to pile on if there is something. And so then I wait too long and then the conversation blows up because it's um, I, I've held it back for way too long because I didn't do it. So how do we lean in and still meet people at their need but not avoid because I'll want to avoid the conflict? So how do you handle that kind of stuff? Do you have experience with that? That's a great question. Demara, Heather, (laughs) anybody anybody got anything? (laughs) Well, I mean, I guess I'll just start and and by all means, please, one of you two, you know, correct everything wrong I'm about to say. But I mean, I don't know. To me, so much of healthy conflict comes down to uh, self-awareness. How am I presenting myself Mm -hmm. to others? And then awareness of of the other. Like what what do they need from me in this environment? And I, I just don't know that you can prepare for that without talking about it. Mm. Now, it requires some emotional maturity to kind of say, okay, well, uh, Josh, if I'm going to have a conversation with you about sort of what I need and how I'm going to act in conflict, like I'm sort of giving you some rules here right. and I need to like be agreeing to play by those rules. Now, if I'm unwilling to play by the rules, that creates a whole different you know, right. challenge. Right. But I just think as we understand each other and the Enneagram type can help with that and we understand our own triggers, that can help us to uh, exist in conflict in a way that maybe is more issue focused than person focused, which yeah. is just a general conflict mm. principle yeah. that's helpful. Yeah. So I don't know. That's just kind of one thing that comes to mind. I don't know. Either of you have anything, uh, hopefully of some value to add. <laughs> <laughs> that's helpful. Yeah. Do you? Um, nothing comes to mind necessarily on the conflict specifically, I guess, mm-hmm. but just like you're aware of your tendency is to avoid. So then if you know that's yours specifically, like, okay, let me push myself to go a little bit faster than I would and address it sooner. And yeah. for me, it's, I know my tendency is to be whatever anybody needs me to be. So I would very much, much be focused on, okay, her inner critic, let me wait or try to just fix it. So I guess just understanding our own biases, which is really digging into the Enneagram and understanding your own type yeah. would kind of give you a more nuanced answer. Yeah. yeah, I think so. I'm trying to think of a parallel that might happen between Dave and I with the nine and the three. And I think for some, some for us is, is pace. So, mm. um, Dave's just, he's more of a doer and, and he's, he can move at a faster pace and get things done that tires me out quicker. And so we're, mm-hmm. we're kind of doing, we do that pace dance a lot. And for me, I have to, I have to know to tell him you're moving too fast for me before I'm so exhausted that Mm. I'm, uh, you know, I'm a a puddle (laughs) (laughs) and then, right. And he can move too fast without the, without the slowing down. And so for, I feel like for us, the dance we do is I have to know my own exhaustion Mm. quicker and I have to articulate it, um, 
which is vulnerable, yeah. you know, because I'm, I'm admitting some of my own limitations. Um, and then he has to then, oh yeah, I'm going to slow down to meet your pace or I'm going to speed up to meet his pace. Yeah. I don't know. Is, is that similar at all? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and I think because part of the but part of the issue. No, that is great. Um, I thought and, it was pretty similar, but hey, what do I know? Yeah, no, I'm just, I'm really just kidding. Uh, but yeah, it's it is similar. I think what um, well where we struggle, um, not to get too personal without her permission here, but um, where we struggle is that she's already beat herself up yeah. for something so much that if I. I begin to say that it feels like even to me because of the empathy of a nine yeah. naturally anyway, that I'm just piling on yeah. and I don't want to pile on. Yeah. And so, but then we don't end up ever having that conversation and what we've need to work on. And we're going to be going to the fighting fair, um, you know, workshop here in the end of August because we need to create a yeah. language and a dialogue for how do we um, engage each other um, in all of this. Um, yeah. And so I think the, I think that pacing is actually a really good idea, but it's establishing that pace ahead of time yeah. because she, she doesn't have a distinct pace um, that she's operating in. It's all very situational. Um, and so I got to pick my spots and <laughs> bob weave and uh, keep, the, keep the hands up uh, and yeah. all. <laughs> Delicate dance of uh, marital conversation. But I mean, but in, you know, but but even in all of this, in, in what you've described, Heather, and what you've described, Josh, I think that I mean, obviously, a marriage relationship is very unique, and I think that that we can even see in the way that the two of you have reflected, and I, and I could certainly share similar reflections. How just your own self awareness and your o- awareness of your spouse house it hasn't fixed everything no. but yeah. it is helped oh yeah oh, and it has yeah. created some additional understanding which i just think is just it's, a, it's another tool in the toolbox to right. use to help build oh. something positive and, and not you know, destroy absolutely yeah. i am less frustrated by the idiosyncrasies of my wife now than i was six months ago yeah eight months ago a year ago because my understanding of her has gone way up Mm -hmm. that i now understand her internal motivations she's not critical of of me if she comes home and the house isn't absolutely spotless she just notices when things are out of place and she wants to fix it yeah um and it's but it's not she's not mad at me she's not angry at me she's not talking bad about me behind my back because the the sofa pillow was a quarter of an inch <laughs> off. Like it, it, she just notices that things and she can't relax yeah. until things are back to normal. Yeah. And understanding that about her has created so much more grace yeah. that when those things are brought up, I don't take it personally yeah. anymore yeah, where I used to. So good. That's good. Yeah. That's really good. Now, or were you going to oh, say something? Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, I think one of the, there was, there was a huge freeing thing too with the, the oh, nine, yeah. three dynamic that <laughs> Dave and I have, because I feel like, with the whole pace thing for us, I used to judge myself that I couldn't Mm. keep up. It's like, why can't I keep up with all these other people around me? I'm just lazy or whatever, you Mm. know, and I feel like exhausted because I'm exhausted. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But it was, but there was a huge judgment that I had on myself Mm. that this brought wonderful freedom that I can recognize the strength that I can now bring to the table and the strength that my husband brings to the table and then how we balance one another out. There's, it's just, it's been hugely freeing for me. Yeah. I think kind of a underlying theme that I'm hearing under all of it is this idea of it helps us to love well, yeah, yep. to love ourselves and to love them. Like you said, yep. not as a weapon. That's no. not what it's for, but it's to okay. Now that I know you better, how can I love you well and yep. love myself, yeah, yep. well too. You know, I think this is kind of a dumb analogy, but uh, I think about uh, the way that we perceive sound as we age. I mean, we know that mm. uh, our ability to hear and the range at which we can hear and our experience of different sounds is different. Like a seventy-year-old and a thirty-year-old. Mm can hear the exact same thing and they are having different Mm. auditory experiences. Like they can stand in our worship center in the middle of the exact same song standing right next to each other. And it's not, there could be, they could, and we could ask, Hey, what do you think of the music? 
And they could have an opinion based on personal preference and all this other stuff, but also they are having a fundamentally different experience wow. because of yeah. how their ears are attuned. And and that has been helpful to me, certainly in my marriage, but in, in other areas as well, just to, re- especially when I find myself frustrated by somebody's yeah. response is, is just to recognize, okay, what they're, exp- if, I, if I'd say, oh, I'd handle that situation differently, maybe um, that might be true. But I also need to recognize that this person who is a different Enneagram type, who is a different human being, who is made in a different way, they are having a fundamentally different experience than right. I am. Yeah. Uh, or That's I read good. recently, uh, like, so I have like sleeping issues and I'm like constantly tired all the time and I've just learned mm-hmm. to kind of deal with it. And whereas uh, different other people that I, that I know just absolutely collapse when they're, I mean, they're just, they just can't talk to you, can't do anything when they're tired. Right. And I always would sort of have this judgmental attitude towards people who are like that. Like, why can't mm-hmm. you just come on, just, just figure it out. Right. And I was reading recently about how uh, basically about a third of people can sort of function and do okay when they're tired. A third struggle a little bit and a third just, it doesn't matter what they do. They just can't get over it. Mm-hmm. Right. And to realize, okay, uh, I didn't choose which category I was in any more than I chose my hair right. color. So maybe I can just recognize people are made differently and I can bemoan it and criticize it and get mad about it or I can adjust to it. Yeah. And I think the Enneagram is kind of the same mm-hmm. to say, okay, yeah. well, how can I adjust, have compassion for those who are different than me? Yeah. I think it can save us a lot of sort of subtle selfishness that creeps into a lot of our interactions. Um, okay, so next thing, we've talked about this in terms of relationships with one another, but uh, we are Christians after all. Let's talk <laughs> about how this can influence our relationship with God. And I want to start with, uh, Damara, I know you've done some work on this. You've even led some workshops on this uh, about how our Enneagram type or understanding our Enneagram type can help us to hear God. Can you share with us a little bit about that? Yeah, so it's, I think kind of at its foundation is realizing that the way we relate to other people mm-hmm. is a lot how we, the way we relate to God. Yeah. And so that might seem really simple and obvious, but I think a lot of the times we're like, yeah, in some ways, but in some ways, no, I know it's totally different. I know this has gotten, I think yeah. that can very much be true. But I think there's ways, for example, self-image, how yeah. um, Enneagram explains how each type has a different self-image, the yeah. way that they need to be seen to feel okay and be at peace and feel safe. Um, and that we portray that even with God yeah. also of realizing, okay, this is how I feel safe with people because this is how I feel safe as a person. Mm-hmm. This is also how I feel safe as God then and realizing, okay, I don't need to be stuck to that if I ever move outside of that mm-hmm. self image. So for me as a type two, for example, it's um, being generous, being always available, being others focused mm-hmm. very much, always adding something to the group or the room, the conversation and realizing, wow, I do that with God. Too. Mm-hmm. So I'll sit and be still with God if I can, but I'm always, I'm still subconsciously trying to tweak myself to like, okay, I'm really grateful now, God, and I'm, <laughs> I'm just praising you or I'm listening really well because, and so it's just still realizing this performance yeah. in there. That's, um, that's interesting. That's yeah. Good. yeah. And, and recognizing how our early relationships, specifically our parents, how that has shaped us and how mm-hmm. we tend to yeah. see God as like the combination of our parents mm-hmm. and that like subconsciously believe that God thinks of us the way our parents do. Mm-hmm. So if our parents were um, just different, maybe they loved us well the best they could, but they were different. And what we got was we're different. We're wrong. Like mm-hmm. my dad is frustrated with me because I'm not as perceptive as he is, mm-hmm. or um, my dad doesn't have the energy to be with me or I'm too much, um, I overwhelm my mom or something, just realizing that we put that on our dad. So understanding how we're put together and Mm -hmm. certain aspects of the Enneagram that could help show us that. Um, And the voices that we're prone to hear when we try to hear God Mm -hmm. um, and being able to discern, okay, well, that's what I'm likely to hear um, of for me. Um, Like, okay, well, just do more, focus on other people or help more. Or there's a need, you have to meet it. And I may be exhausted (laughs) and burnt out and I have a migraine and I just, what I need to do is lay down. But I feel like, wait, Holy Spirit, is that you telling me to go help that person right now? And so being able to realize that and to just have a greater level of intimacy Mm. Yeah, that. yeah, that discernment component is helpful, and uh, yeah, to, to what extent is am I like experiencing some confirmation bias here, where I feel mm-hmm. like, oh, this is what I'm inclined to do, so I feel like, oh, this has got to be what God is saying to me. Yeah, when right. really to to act on that would only 
kind of lead to some some unhealth. And that can be especially challenging, I think, for, for numbers like twos, where, where so much of it is so noble, right? It's like, oh, well, we got to right. help and be then and this and that. And it's like, well, right. well, yeah, but you also need to recognize your limits, right? And, and anyway, and yeah. all of that is, is interesting. How What are some other ways? I mean, it's, I, I absolutely agree that the Enneagram can help us hear God. And what are some other ways that just in discipleship environments or in our, in our own spiritual growth, uh, how can the Enneagram help us. Uh, Josh or Heather or even Damara, if you have anything there, would, would love to hear your perspective on it. I think, um, well, one, it helps me be more truly seen by God mm. because I'm yeah. naming <laughs> those areas that I might have been ashamed of or maybe not mm. known, didn't have the self-awareness. So just naming it and then, you know, being with God on that deepens that level of intimacy with him and my yeah. ability to be transformed. Um, I feel like it's helped me. Tra- it's helped me identify some areas of shame and mm. and reject that and and replace that with truth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, mm. And uh, and and I feel like I mean this sounds kind of silly, but I, I also feel like it's really increased my ability for confession and repentance hmm. because I see some of my faults a little more clearly. Mm. Um, or my temptations towards sin and then the places yeah. where my flesh gives in to sin, I'm yeah. quicker to confess and repent and receive forgiveness as opposed to maybe just being stuck in kind of that unknowing yeah. bad habit. Um, so I feel like that's created a deeper relationship with God too. Yeah. Enneagram for me with my relationship with God and my devotional life is it's given me permission to engage with God differently than mm. other people um, because um, I'm not the, the get up early in the morning, go getter that a th- typical three might be of just like wake up, ready to go, the fully rested. I don't wake up rested really ever. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, so that whole idea is just foreign to me, but the, but the idea that I can engage with God in the way that he created me um, just as powerfully and intimately as somebody else um, has given me permission to to go on a walk and and pray as I do that or to to read um, a Bible at my own pace. Mm-hmm. I don't need to cover 48 chapters in order to feel like I had a meaningful devotional. Like there's there's just different things um, for me that it's I'm because I'm not achievement oriented um, as a, as a nine. I my spiritual walk with God is not based on a goal that I need to cross off this 50 minutes. I need to do 20 minutes of this. And now I'm done. Like I'm, I'm giving myself permission to engage with God throughout the day at my own pace. And that's good. Mm. Um, and that's going to form me more into his heart, um, than it is to just try to fit God into my time schedule or to what I feel like I'm supposed to do. Yeah. 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 No, that's, that's, I mean, that's good. And, and to, to give yourself the, the grace to engage with God in a way that makes sense for you, right. not in a way that conforms to somebody else. And I mean, I like what you said, Heather, too, about just that idea of being seen, which it's like, I I feel like that's one of those things where it's like, before I engage with the Enneagram, if someone asked, do you really feel seen by God? I would say, oh yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Of course mm-hmm. I do. Whereas like now I feel like, now, I mean, I think God saw me, but being seen is different than feeling seen. Yeah. <laughs> and it's almost like I needed the self-awareness yeah. mm. to really feel like I was being seen as I, I truly am. Yeah. Do, you remember, do you have anything to add to this in terms of other ways that the, the Enneagram could be helpful as a spiritual growth tool? Yeah. So I think I first heard it from Chris Hewitt in his book, The Sacred Enneagram. Mm-hmm. He talks about contemplative prayer. Yeah. Yep. Highly recommend it. Um, and one piece of it is this idea of prayer posture mm. um, for each of the three intelligence centers. Like Josh mm. was saying earlier, you have the eight, nine, one in the body and the gut and the two, three, four type in the heart and the five, six, seven in the head. Mm-hmm. And how each of those triads have different ways of kind of combating. He calls them, I think, like compulsions, mm-hmm. basically, yeah. <laughs> where it's like this drive to do for the gut. It's like do. And so their prayer posture is stillness to just be still and I've actually talked to quite a few type nines who have found that they hear God sometimes the most powerfully when they're just still Hmm. like oftentimes they're laid out on the floor for some reason like a health thing or they're just stressed or they're just worn out and they're just still on the floor and they hear God a lot and for the heart types it's solitude and that was really powerful for me this getting away and realizing who am I if I'm not around people if I'm not helping somebody so good and then silence for the head types because then in silence you're kind of 
there in your own brain and you have the fears of, am I competent? Will I be taken care of? Will I be stuck in this pain? And you kind of are forced to address those fears instead of trying to just tune them out. Yeah. Yeah. Man, that's, that's so good. Um, were you say something? Oh, I was just, one of the projects that I've been working on, um, that I haven't finished, but I've been trying to find scripture that speaks to each type's kind of core need Mm, because I feel like, like love languages, right? God's word speaks to each of us individually. And I think that's another thing that can draw us deeper into that relationship with God and with one another, because like, okay, here's your core need. Here's the core truth where our great God speaks to all of it, Mm -hmm. (laughs) you know, in intimate and unique ways. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's really good. A, A couple of ways that I've, I've seen this, um, kind of work itself out in me in terms of helping my own maturity and all of that is, is, is a couple things. Number one is that first of all, the, uh, the, any, part of the power of the Enneagram is it kind of points out your core basic fear of each yeah. type. Yeah. And, uh, the, according to the Enneagram Institute, the seven's basic fear is of being deprived and in pain. Uh, right. So, so my basic mm. fear according to the Enneagram is, is pain. And I, I find in myself a bit of pain avoidance, uh, especially in my tendency to want to uh, fix problems immediately, especially in my tendency to be very emotional and exuberant in positive ways for Mm. silly things, but to tend to be very stoic and unemotional about negative things or even, uh, even, you know, more serious things and to just recognize, okay, my fear is pain. And like, I'm not going to seek out pain. I don't know that anybody does, <laughs> but to just recognize my tendency to get rid, get to to get rid of it quickly and then to say okay, no, maybe I need to just sit in this pain. Maybe it's emotional mm-hmm. pain. Maybe it's just yeah. intellectual pain of not being able to figure something out. Maybe I'm in you know some other type of pain that maybe God might want to meet me yeah. here. Yeah. And to it it, it sounds odd to say to not be afraid of fear, but it's like that that's kind of it mm-hmm. a little bit. Oh yeah. And then the other side of it too is I think it's helpful in identifying uh, our idols. Um, yeah. So, oh, yeah. so again, so much of a seven is you want experiences and fun and all of that. And as I look at a lot of my interests in life, that matches with somebody who's into experiences. And like I don't think it's wrong to seek out fun and exciting experiences, but I need to make sure that they're in their place. That on some level, the search for the ultimate incredible experience is a futile search that I can climb every mountain that I could go to every basketball game that I can experience every fun thing I can think of. And there's still going to be more. So I need to just put those things in their place, allow them to be things I enjoy and appreciate and that turn my worship back towards God and not be things I'm counting on for my fulfillment. And I think we could sit here and go through one through nine and say, okay, these are, this is how you're prone to idolatry. It doesn't mean that, but it doesn't mean it's bad. But I mean, we know this. It's what an idol is. It's a typically a good thing that we try to make ultimate. Yeah. And I guess that's been helpful to me to sort of identify some of that idolatry in my heart. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Exactly. And the places where we're more prone to temptation. Yeah. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. that's real, and we're all prone to temptation in different ways. And when you can identify it, then it's just so much easier to yeah. combat it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. When it's subtle and un- underneath the surface, yeah. it's it's tough. Well. Mm-hmm. uh, We've already burned our whole hour, so we're we have wow. we are we are out of time. It feels like we've only scratched the surface here. But uh, before uh, before we wrap, just just last thing, wanna wanna resource people. I know even in our Facebook comments, we've had a lot of people saying, yeah. "What the heck are you talking about?" And where do I where, learn more? Where do we start? Yeah. If you have hung with us this long, not knowing what the Enneagram God is, first of all, wow. <laughs> Second of all, uh, we do want to provide some resources, just yeah. maybe recommendations we would have of of things that have been helpful, and this is another one where we'll go around and maybe Josh will start with you. Uh, just maybe name uh, a resource or two, podcast, book, article, whatever, uh, that has been helpful for you that you would maybe recommend for those wanting to, to learn more. So, Yeah, yeah. The, the Typology podcast I think is huge yep. um, because that, that gives a lot of verbiage and you get to hear people talk about their number and then the Road Back to You was uh, formational for me. Yeah. Yeah, that's the book by Ian Morgan Cron and yeah. Susan Susan Stabile. Yeah. yeah. So Road Back to You, it's got a yellow cover, very popular. So mm-hmm. yeah. uh, Demara, how about you? Yeah, so I usually recommend Road Back to You as a first one to yeah. people. Usually they've already read it a yeah. lot of the times and it's like, oh, great. That's a great introduction. But I usually tell them either Marilyn Vansel's Self mm-hmm. to Lose, Self to Find as a second one 
Because okay. it, I really like her intro section where she yeah. explains how this fits together. Mm. Um, and then, or Rizzo and Hudson, they do the Enneagram Institute. Okay. They have a book called The Wisdom of the Enneagram, which I usually say is the second one. Mm -hmm. And then Sacred Enneagram is the third one. It's yeah. deep. It, yeah. You don't want to go into it knowing nothing about the Enneagram. No. Um, but my favorite all-time resource is The Sleeping at Last. Um, he has nine Enneagram songs. He's a... Oh, artist. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think Heather shared yeah. some of those. Oh, so good. Okay. So that Sleeping nine, at Last. Mm -hmm, so that's his, mm. it's Ryan O'Neill who okay. does music under Sleeping at Last. Okay. And it's, he has a whole Atlas year two, I believe it is, a whole playlist. So it's 25 songs. Oh, nine of those I've songs. I've forgotten about those. Those oh, are great. You got it. Those, oh, yes. so good. Oh, man. They will um, bring you to tears. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. And it's mm. even nice to tell people sometimes a quick way to kind of get of an idea of which type you might mm. be to just see if one moves you in particular. Yeah. Um, but it's the, nine songs in particular are written from the perspective of each of the nine types. Yeah. And then he has a podcast where he explains how he created the songs. It's and beautiful. Then, oh, wow. And Chris Hewart, who wrote The Sacred Enneagram, is his like, Enneagram expert on there, and he explains more about the types. So it's just fascinating wow, and like fun. that's like a dream team of Enneagram yeah. wisdom. <laughs> yeah. They're, dang, yeah. I, yeah, gosh, <laughs> now I'm having this, like, flashback to when Heather sent me the seventh song, and it just, like, laid me out. <laughs> like, oh, gosh. I'm, I'm fleeing from the pain right now. As I <laughs> anyway, Heather, how about you? <laughs> um, yeah, I would echo um, Marilyn Vancer, Self to Lose, Self to Find. She is a, is a profoundly Christian perspective, mm -hmm. so she's got a great section in there on grounding everything in scripture. Yeah. Um, so that would be, it's a great place to start. Um, Reading People by, um, I'm trying to think of her name, Bogle, um, is got a small section on the Enneagram, but if you love just kind of personality stuff in general, she goes over, I think, eight or nine different personality oh, wow. assessments wow. and talks about the strengths and weaknesses of each one. So mm. that's, it's a easy, super oh, easy cool. read. Um, and then Stu Suzanne Stabile has actually created her own podcast now. It's called The Enneagram Journey. Yeah. Um, and I like that one just as much as typology. Um, and then she does workshops as well. My husband and I, Life in the Trinity Ministry is her is her kind of website and her mm -hmm. ministry. And my son and I were able to actually go to one of her workshops mm -hmm. in San Diego, which was so worth the time. I would travel to where she is. It was so good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. So as you can hear, there are a great many uh, resources out there. Certainly would echo uh, Road Back to You. The Enneagram Institute has a yeah. website that's mm -hmm. very helpful. Demera's website, enneagramus.com. <laughs> Check that one out as well. Uh, but encourage you to, to take a look at uh, learning about your own Enneagram type. If you don't know uh, already. Careful not to try to type other people, right? That's yeah. what they say <laughs> not to do. Yeah. But uh, just the self-awareness that can come from that is very beneficial. So uh, thank you, first of all, Damara, for coming in and, and joining us. Uh, thank you, Josh and Heather, for mm -hmm. uh, the time today as well. Thanks to you for listening. And once again, uh, encourage you to just engage with the Enneagram. See if as you s study the Enneagram, learn about yourself, that maybe there's stuff there for, for God to speak to you and to help you understand uh, you, help you understand your relationship with him and to help you in all of your different relationships. Thanks for joining us on this episode of Engaging Culture. We'll be back uh, next week because this is a week five. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. We'll see you then. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Engaging Culture, a podcast by Bridgeway Christian Church. If you enjoyed the show, please consider subscribing and leaving a review on iTunes. Thank you so much for listening. Music is used under the Creative Commons license and is provided by Dexter Britton.